All right, so um, I would like to thank you all um, to be here for this SIB virtual seminar. Today we have the pleasure to host uh, Joshua Payne, who is an assistant professor at the com uh, of computational biology, so at the Institute of Interactive Biology of the Department of Environmental System Science from the ETH Zurich. So jo Joshua did his undergrad in mathematics and computer science in at the Regis University in Denver, Colorado. is a master's in operation research at the, the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, and New York. And is, he obtained his PhD in computer science in 2009 at the University of Vermont. Then from 2009 to 2011, he was a postdoctoral researcher in the computational genetics laboratory at Dartmouth College and then, from 2012 to 2015, uh, in, it was at the Department of Evolutionary Biology and Environmental Studies at the University of Zurich, where he continued as a junior group leader, funded by an SNF Ambitione. And then, since 2017, he is a, a, a SNSF Assistant Professor at the ETH Zurich, and since 2019, he's also a group leader at the SIB, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. So Joshua is really interested in evolution in vivo and in silico. His current focus is on gene regulation, particularly at the level of transcription, as well as genotype, phenotype maps, and networks. So the group is also is, is, is therefore interested in understanding the design constraints, the robustness, and evolution of and gene regulatory systems, particularly at the level of transcription, using both modeling and data-driven approaches. So today, Josh will tell us more on empirical genotype phenotype maps of transcriptional and post-transcriptional regulation. So thank you again, Josh, for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and for the invitation. Thank you, everyone who's here in the real world and everyone who's watching virtually. Um, right, so the title of the talk is Empirical Genotype Phenotype Maps of Transcriptional and Post-Transcriptional Regulation. I'm, I'm broadly interested in evolution. I happen to have this emphasis on, on gene regulation um, right now, particularly at the level of transcription, although, as this title suggests, I've also done a bit of work um, at the level of post-transcription. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit today. And I, I think that this uh, sort of interest in, in gene regulation um, and the evolution of gene regulation really comes from uh, a fascination with the kinds of evolutionary adaptations, innovations that are caused by um, DNA sequence changes that affect gene regulation. And we have loads of examples of this, right? We have examples of um, pigmentation patterns that have changed via um, DNA sequence changes that impact gene regulation, including important evolutionary innovations such as the formation of, of um, eye spots on butterfly wings, which helps butterflies to avoid um, predators. We also have examples from um, um, morphological evolution, right? So we have examples of um, changes in the helmet structures of tree hoppers, um, body armor and fish, and entire body plans in, in vertebrates. These are just a small uh, number of examples. There are also many examples in uh, physiology and behavior where you have real adaptations and innovations that have come about by mutations that affect the level, timing, or location of gene expression. And all of these examples serve to highlight the evolvability of gene regulation. And by that, I mean the ability of mutation to bring forward um, different phenotypes, some of which may be uh, adaptive. But of course, not all of these uh, changes in phenotype are adaptive, right? So mutations that affect when, where, and to what extent genes are expressed are also commonly implicated in disease. A really classical example is polydactyly in humans, where you're born with um, an extra digit. And this is caused by a mutation in a DNA sequence that affects gene expression. This particular kind of sequence is called an enhancer. Um, and this is, this is clearly not like the worst disease that you can be born with, but these kinds of mutations that affect gene regulation are also implicated in truly devastating diseases, including uh, many cancers. 
And so just as it's, it's important for mutations to that affect gene regulation to be able to bring forth phenotypic variability, it's also important that um, gene regulation is robust to uh, such mutations. And for the past several years, I've, I've been kind of studying this interplay between robustness and evolvability in gene regulation. And in this talk, I'd like to give sort of an overview of um, uh, a series of studies that I, I've conducted uh, over this period of time. Um, uh, more generally, my, my approach to studying uh, evolution, in particular the evolution of gene regulation, is, is sort of, I sort of have three um, parts of this, this, this study, so three approaches. Um, one is purely theoretical, so I work with computational models of gene regulatory systems, and I use these models to try to answer questions that uh, we can't currently address using experiments. Uh, the second approach of my research program is data-driven, so I work with publicly available functional genomics data, um, such as data that describe when and where regulatory proteins bind the genome to affect gene expression, um, actual measurements of gene expression in terms of um, the abundance of RNA molecules, and also uh, measurements of chemical modifications of DNA and histones um, that cause or are caused by uh, gene regulation. And the third approach to my research program is to collaborate with experimentalists. So I'm a computer scientist by training, right? Like I wouldn't want to be part of a lab that would let me in it. Um, but I, I do work closely with some experimental groups. In particular, I work with uh, Yolanda Shirley, who's here at the University of Lausanne. Um, and this is a really nice opportunity to bring some of uh, the ideas that we have from our theoretical analyses into the lab. And it also provides us an opportunity to help them sort of make sense of some of the experimental um, results that they're generating by um, complementing those results with the kinds of mathematical and computational techniques that, that we're familiar with. Um, but for the purpose of today's talk, I'm actually just going to focus on a series of study that, studies that come from this data-driven side of my research program. Um, and what I'd like to, to highlight uh, with these studies is how we use some old ideas from evolutionary theory to sort of make sense of uh, how gene regulatory systems are, are robust and evolvable. And in so doing, this allowed us to sort of reanimate some old ideas in evolutionary theory. The first idea has its roots in a paper that John Maynard Smith wrote to Nature in 1970. And he called this, uh, this paper, uh, Natural Selection in, in the Concept of a Protein Space. And this letter was actually a response to a letter that was written a year earlier by Frank Salisbury, in which Salisbury put forward what he thought was sort of a problem in, in evolutionary theory. And I think that this, this purported problem is summed up well with this, this, this couple of sentences here, where Salisbury says, if life really depends on each gene being as unique as it appears to be, then it is too unique to come into being by chance mutations. There will be nothing for natural selection to act on. And he sets up this problem by considering a hypothetical protein. So this hypothetical protein is encoded by uh, a nucleic acid sequence of length 1,000. And since the DNA alphabet has four letters to it, there are therefore four to the thousand possible DNA sequences of this length, which is roughly 10 to the 600, which exceeds the number of carbon atoms in the observable universe by several hundreds of orders of magnitude. And Salisbury said, well, you know, if functional sequences are so rare, then even if one of these functional sequences were to come into being by chance, Natural selection would have nothing to work on because if you mutate that sequence, it's highly unlikely you're going to get another one of these exceedingly rare functional sequences. And Maynard Smith said, well, you know, in this argument, there's sort of this implicit assumption that those sequences that are functional are just distributed at randomly throughout the space of all possible sequences, but sequence space might actually not be organized that way. And he put forward this argument using a really simple and effective word game. This word game works as follows. You take two words from the English language, in this case, word and gene, they have to be of the same length. And you try to convert one word into the other by a series of single letter changes such that all of the intermediate words are also members of the English language. All right, so you can change word into war, war into gore, gore into gone, and finally gone into gene. And the analogy with evolution, I think, is straightforward. So if you're talking about proteins, the letters represent amino acids. Um, the single letter changes represent amino acid substitutions, 
And this requirement that the intermediate words are also members of the English language is akin to the requirement that the protein is somehow functional or has some particular phenotype. And I, I think this went a long way to emphasize Maynard Smith's point that once you have a functional sequence, you're highly likely to have other functional sequences in the sort of mutational vicinity of that, that one um, functional sequence. But I also think this example helps to put you in, in Salisbury's mindset, right? If you think about this, the English language has 26 letters, right? So that means there are 26 to the four possible four-letter words. That's 456,976 possible four-letter words. According to Scrabble, there's only 4,175 viable real English words that are length four, right? So less than 1% of the space of all possible English words of length four is actually populated by English words. So it's not trivial that you should just be able to draw these paths, right? I don't think Salisbury was really like, just crazy for saying what he said. I think that it's, it's a, it was a reasonable thing to think. And the reason that Salisbury was wrong is that language, like biological sequence space, exhibits a correlation structure. So once you have a sequence that has a particular function, it's likely that it's going to be surrounded mutationally by other sequences that have the same or similar function. In English, if you look at, for instance, the words around word and the words around gene, again, according to Scrabble, you see there's these clusters of words. I think what, what else is surprising about this particular figure is that these are all English words, right? These are not necessarily like colloquial English words, but they're, they're technically correct. So a, a, a neem is a monetary unit of Samoa, for instance. A sword is the collective noun for um, mallards. You might, I don't know, next cocktail party put that to use. Um, right, so, so John Maynard Smith sort of postulated that uh, these, what I would call genotype networks, so networks of genotypes, networks of sequences that all have the same phenotype. In Maynard Smith's example, that phenotype is just that the person is functional, but you could be more general about that. So he postulated these genotype networks would exist and that they would populate the space of, of possible genotypes and that this would help to facilitate evolution because once you had a sequence that was somehow functional, then in fact natural selection would have something to work with because mutations would be likely to create other functional sequences. Right? But it actually wasn't for another 20 years before um, this idea was uh, sort of borne out in um, any kind of, a, uh, in, in this case, it turned out to be a computational model of a biological system, but it, it took more than two decades to have any kind of real validation of Maynard Smith's idea. And that first came about in a computational model of um, protein folding. So you have amino acid sequences, that's your genotype, and then your phenotype is uh, the particular uh, second or tertiary structure that that sequence folds into. And these genotype networks were found to populate the space of possible um, proteins. And this was then found in a variety of other systems, um, all computational models of biological systems, um, and people started to think about other implications for the existence of these so-called genotype networks. And there are two implications that are relevant for today's talk. The first is um, uh, mutational robustness. So what I'm showing you here is what, a genotype network, and this, this box is sort of the space of all possible genotypes. So each vertex in this network is a genotype, so it's, it's a sequence, and edges connect uh, vertices, their corresponding sequences differ in a single small mutation, such as a point mutation. And I've colored the vertices according to their phenotype, so these all have some phenotype that's indicated by the color black. Right? So you have all of these different genotypes that are mutationally interconnected with one another, and they all have the same phenotype. And this has an implication for mutational robustness because if you were to take one of these genotypes and mutate it, there's a chance that you're going to get another sequence or another genotype that's also on the genotype network, which means it also has the same phenotype. Right? So that, that the phenotype would be robust to that particular mutation. So the existence of genotype networks confers robustness to the genotypes those networks harbor. The second implication for the existence of genotype networks is evolvability, it regards evolvability, which I mean the ability of mutation to bring forth phenotypic variation, some of which is adaptive. And the reason that the existence of genotype networks have implications for evolvability is that these genotype networks do not exist in isolation in genotype space. Rather, these genotype spaces are populated by many genotype networks of different phenotypes. And these genotype 
networks interface and overlap with one another. So as a population uh, spreads out neutrally on one of these genotype networks, subsequent mutations can uh, create new phenotypes. So since these genotype networks spread throughout the space of, of possible genotypes and they bump into the genotype networks of other phenotypes, mutation can bring forth phenotypic variability. Right, so the existence of genotype networks has implications for robustness and evolvability, and it also helps us to understand how these two properties can be synergistic. So how can something, how can some system be simultaneously robust and evolvable? And this particular question is one that had been addressed in computational models of biological systems, but never in experimental data. And the reason, getting back to Salisbury, Salisbury's argument, is that um, the space of possible sequences is so vast that if you wanted to uh, characterize this space experimentally, it would simply be impossible for um, so, so even like small macromolecules. Um, however, we were at this time studying gene regulation, and we had thought, well, you know, maybe one way to get around this would be actually to study a subcomponent of a larger biological system. And that larger biological system is a gene regulatory circuit, and these are important for driving the expression patterns that embody crucial biological functions and development, um, physiology, and behavior. And the important subcomponent are the interactions between regulatory proteins called transcription factors and DNA. So these, these proteins are sequence-specific DNA binding proteins that bind DNA to regulate gene expression, either by recruiting RNA polymerase or by getting in the way of RNA polymerase. Um, and importantly, the, the strength of this binding event is directly related to this, this regulatory effect, to its activating or inhibitory, inhibitory effect. Um, and in, in studying gene regu regulation, we were aware of some data sets that exhaustively characterized the binding preferences of these proteins to all possible DNA sequences of a given short length, specifically all sequences of length 8. So you can think of this as a mapping between genotype and phenotype, where the genotype is a DNA sequence, and its phenotype is whether or not it binds a particular regulatory protein. You can also think of it as the actual strength with which it binds a regulatory protein. So just to give you a, a kind of a feel for these data, these data come from a technology called protein binding microarrays. Um, these are chip-based, um, it's a chip-based technology, and on these chips, you have probes. In each probe, you have double-stranded DNA sequences that are chosen in such a way that every single DNA sequence of length 8 is represented on this chip at least 16 times. And so you can, um, you can get a, uh, an assessment of the affinity with which a regulatory protein binds to every single possible DNA sequence of length 8 by looking at the fluorescent intensity of the spots that contain the DNA sequence relative to the spots that do not contain the DNA sequence. Um, what's important for today's talk is just to know that for every single DNA sequence of length 8, you have a measurement of binding strength, the binding affinity to that sequence of length 8. And you have such data for a large number of transcription factors. Um, the first studies I'll talk about, we worked with on the order of 100 transcription factors, and later uh, more data were available where we're working on the order of 1,000 uh, transcription factors. So we can use these data to construct these genotype networks that uh, Maynard Smith had, had, had uh, postulated. Um, and I'll show you sort of how we do this by example. So let's say you were to pull down protein binding microarray data for a single transcription factor. In this case, it's just a transcription factor called SRY. And you were to look at the distribution of the number of binding sites that have a given binding affinity. You'd see a distribution that looks just like this. So the mode of this distribution um, just represents sequences that bind non-specifically. So these transcription factors are just attracted to the DNA backbone. But then you also have this right tail in the distribution that represents sequences that bind the transcription factors specifically. So what you can do is you can just set a threshold on this tail, and you can say, OK, everything above uh, this threshold we consider specifically bound by the transcription factor, and everything below is non-specifically bound. And you can then build up a genotype network um, out of these sequences, and you can do so for a large number of, of transcription factors to sort of populate this space of all possible genotypes. So I'll show you how we do that by example. So let's say that 
this particular transcription factor just binds three sequences. You would represent each sequence as a vertex in a network, and you would connect vertices by an edge if the corresponding sequences differ by a single small mutation. So in this case, we have this one point mutation that makes this top sequence differ from the middle sequence. And here you see another single point mutation that makes this bottom sequence differ from the middle sequence. Now, obviously, this uh, particular transcription factor binds more than just these three sequences. This is the subnetwork of this much larger genotype network. But this is kind of Maynard Smith's idea borne out in real data, right? So just to drive the point home, each one of these vertices represents a sequence that binds this particular transcription factor, SRY, and edges connect vertices if their corresponding sequences differ by a single small mutation. And we can study the structure of these genotype networks um, to ask, well, quite a few questions. But um, for instance, we can ask how um, the structure of these networks relates with mutational robustness. Um, we can also ask how these genotype networks facilitate evolvability. And we can do that by not just looking at a single genotype network for a single transcription factor, but populating this space of um, possible sequences with other genotype networks for other transcription factors, which I'm just showing schematically here, and asking how these genotype networks overlap with each other and how they interface with each other. And this gives us a feeling for how mutations in these binding sites could bring forward um, phenotypic variation. In this case, that variation is new binding phenotypes. We can also look at how mutation can abrogate binding, which is also very important in regulatory evolution. Loss of binding sites can cause um, important um, uh, phenotypic variation that is, that is sometimes adapted. All right, so to show this more quantitatively, uh, what I'm showing here on the, the y-axis is our measure of mutational robustness. So I can just explain this really briefly, how we do this. So you, for, so the mutational robustness of a transcription factor's binding sites is the average mutational robustness of the individual binding sites. The mutational robustness of an individual binding site is simply the fraction of all possible mutations to that binding site that create another sequence that also binds the sequence of the transcription factor of interest. Right? So said more simply, it's on average, how often does a mutation to one of a transcription factor's binding sites abrogate binding? So when this robustness value is high, then it's very rare that these mutations um, break binding. And when the robustness is low, it's very often that these mutations um, abrogate binding. OK, so on the y-axis, we have this measure of mutational robustness. On the x-axis, we have the size of the genotype network, shown as a fraction of uh, genotype space. So this is just how many sequences are in this genotype network divided by the total number of, of sequences of length 8. Um, each data point represents a transcription factor. And in this case, we have uh, the closed symbols representing data from mouse and the open triangles representing data from yeast. And what we see is there's this, uh, this sort of logarithmic increase in mutational robustness as a function of the size of the genotype network. And now if we do the same thing where we have evolvability on the y-axis, and evolvability is now defined as the ability of mutation to bring forth new binding phenotypes. So for all of the genotypes in genotype network, we look at all of their one mutant neighbors and ask which transcription factors do those one mutant neighbors bind. And that's our measure of evolvability. It goes from 0 to 1 because we normalize by the number of transcription factors in our data set. That's the maximum. right? Um, and again, we're showing this as a function of the size of the genotype network. And here we see this increase that's much more abrupt, such that uh, these genotype networks only have to occupy about 1% of genotype space before they're, they're maximally evolvable. But, so this, this study helped us to understand how uh, genotype networks sort of mediate this, this synergistic relationship between uh, robustness and evolvability. And this was the first time that this particular relationship was demonstrated in um, experimental data. So getting back to the schematic here, uh, it looks like this, this genotype space of transcription factor binding sites um, is organized in such a way that these, these genotype networks um, are overlapping with one another and inter interfacing with one another. So they're all just like, it's kind of like this mess. They're all really inter highly intertwined um, with one another. Um, and this, uh, in this way, they're, they're both robust and, and evolvable. 
And we're interested in understanding the, sort of the, the generality of this result, especially in the context of, of gene regulation, um, and more specifically in the context of regulatory proteins interacting with uh, the nucleic acid sequence uh, ligands. And so we decided to sort of go one step up in the hierarchy of, of gene regulation and look at RNA-mediated uh, gene regulation, particularly um, uh, regu post-transcriptional gene regulation that's mediated by RNA-binding proteins. So RNA-binding proteins bind RNA molecules to um, uh, regulate their, their, their stability, their transport, their decay, um, among other aspects of, of uh, RNA biology. Um, and what's, what's important here is that we can actually do a comparative analysis of these, these genotype-phenotype maps, where in this case the genotype is now an RNA sequence, and its phenotype is its molecular capacity to bind an RNA binding protein. We can do a comparative analysis here because the biophysics of binding in these, these, two, these two levels of gene regulation are, are highly similar to one another. And what's more, um, the computational pipeline that's used to go from the fluorescent intensity of these, these chips to this measurement of binding affinity that we work with that's literally identical between these two, um, these two experimental protocols. So we really have sort of a head-to-head -head comparison that we can make. So what we want to know is whether or not um, at this level of gene regulation, this particular genotype-phenotype map is organized sort of in the same way. Um, so now we're going to look, we're looking at a, a slightly, we're looking at a different set of data. So now we have uh, the closed symbols representing transcription factors. Here are the data for human and, and fly. And the, the open symbols correspond to RNA binding proteins. And again, on the y-axis, we're looking at robustness. And on the x-axis, X -axis again, the, the size of this genotype network. And we see, once again, this sort of logarithmic scaling. As the genotype network gets larger, um, robustness increases logarithmically. And this was a nice thing to see because this is something that's been predicted um, in computational models of biological systems, right? There's some nice math explaining this. And this is the first time that we were able to show uh, using real data that, um, that this, this scaling relationship holds um, across multiple levels of gene regulation in this case. And now, so, so, so the, mutation, the relationship between mutational robustness and the size of the genotype network is really similar for these two classes of regulatory proteins, right? But now when we move on to vulnerability, the, the story changes. So remember, the closed symbols correspond to transcription factors, the open symbols to RNA binding proteins. And we already saw this really abrupt increase in vulnerability with the size of the genotype network um, in the previous slide um, for transcription factors. But now we're also seeing this for RNA binding proteins, except the, the, the rate of increase is slightly slower. And more importantly, the maximum level of vulnerability is, is quite lower. Right, so this hints that this, the, the architecture of these genotype-phenotype maps really differ between these, these two levels of, of gene regulation. And indeed, if we look at uh, sort of the average mutational distance between these genotype networks from one another, that's what I'm showing on the y-axis um, for fly and human, um, broken down into transcription factors and RNA binding proteins, what we find is that these transcription factor binding sites, these genotype networks of transcription factor binding sites tend to be much closer together in the space of all possible binding sites than are um, the genotype networks of RNA binding protein binding sites. What's more, um, the genotype networks of transcription factor binding sites tend to overlap with one another to a much greater extent than do those for RNA binding protein binding sites. And I think this is particularly surprising because in these data sets, I can show you the numbers, but um, there are, we have more RNA binding proteins in our data sets than we do transcription factors, and we have fewer binding domains in the RNA binding protein data set than we do in transcription factors. And proteins, regulatory proteins with the same binding domain uh, typically bind similar sets of sequences. So, in fact, the data set as it's set up should stack the deck in favor of RNA binding proteins having more overlap. We, we just observed the opposite. Right, so this, this really suggests that the architecture of these genotype-phenotype maps are just fundamentally different. So if we go back to this sort of schematic, it seems that um, these genotype networks of RNA binding protein binding sites um, are just kind of farther away from one another in this, this space of possible binding sites. And in that regard, they are less evolvable than our transcription factor binding sites. All right, so that was a lot of detail. Um, we can kind of come up for air now. So I, I had said, uh, earlier that um, I wanted to show how there are two 
sort of ideas from evolution that helped us to think about these data and how in turn this helped us to um, sort of bring new life into these old ideas from, from evolutionary theory. And now I'd like to, to present this, this second idea, which is much um, better known. So this is the, the metaphor of, of the adaptive landscape, which was put forward by Sewell Wright in, in 1932. And it's a metaphor that really pervades the biological sciences and has shaped evolutionary thought ever since, since its inception. Um, this metaphor is, it, it's, it's not a perfect metaphor, like any metaphor, um, but it is in a metaphor that's akin to a physical space where um, coordinates in physical space corresponds to uh, genotypes in an abstract genotype space and where the elevation of these coordinates um, corresponds to some quantitative phenotype or to sort of the ultimate phenotype of, of organismal fitness. And evolution can then be viewed as a hill climbing process in these landscapes where populations tend to move towards adaptive peaks um, as a consequence of mutation and natural selection. So in the context of uh, transcription factor binding sites, we, we think about uh, where phenotype is this binary, you know, is this sequence bound or not? If we instead start thinking about these sequence, the, the phenotype of these sequences as something quantitative, so what is the, the actual strength with which this particular uh, sequence is bound, we can transform these sort of flat genotype networks that I was showing you before into um, these adaptive landscapes where we can study uh, the ruggedness of these uh, landscapes. And the ruggedness in the adaptive landscape has several important implications for evolutionary processes ranging from the evolution of reproductive isolation to the evolution of sex, how is genetic diversity um, generated and maintained. Um, but what's germane to this particular talk is that uh, the ruggedness of an adaptive landscape has important implications for evolvability, so for the ability of mutation to bring forth phenotypic variation. And the reason that the, the ruggedness in the adaptive landscape has implications for evolvability is that both it's the, the shape of the landscape and the population's location within a landscape determine the amount of uh, phenotypic variation that mutation can bring forth. So for instance, a population that resides in this particular um, uh, region of the adaptive landscape ha may have no problem just by mutation and natural selection marching directly up this hill to the, the global peak in this particular landscape. Whereas a population that is navigating in, in this um, section of the adaptive landscape might get trapped by this, this local optima that's separated by this adaptive valley from the global adaptive peak. So in this way, a population's location within a landscape really determines the, account, the kind of phenotypic variation that um, mutation can bring forth. Right. So we um, analyzed the topographies of um, adaptive landscapes of transcription factor binding affinities for a large number of transcription factors, specifically for 1,137 transcription factors from 129 eukaryotic species, representing 62 DNA binding domains, I believe, each of which you can think of as like a distinct biophysical mechanism by which the transcription factor interacts uh, with DNA. And we could characterize the, the ruggedness of these landscapes in a variety of ways. Some of these ways are really simple, like just counting peaks, how many peaks are in the landscape, for instance. Other measures pertain to things like, like epistasis. Um, and then we can compare these measures of landscape ruggedness with kind of a, a pair of expectations that come from null models. Um, one null model generates very smooth, uh, sort of Mount Fuji-like landscapes. Um, and these kinds of landscapes would pose no obstacle for evolution. It doesn't matter where you are in the landscape, you could always move uphill to the global peak. Um, and we also considered a, a null model that produces very rugged um, landscapes, and these, these uh, really hinder the navigability of, of these landscapes. Um, right. So here we can look at uh, these data and how they compare to the, these null models. So we're looking at, at three distributions here. Each distribution shows you the number of peaks in a landscape. The top, uh, the top panel shows you this distribution for the additive model. The middle panel shows you this distribution for the empirical data, so all 1,137 transcription factors. And the bottom panel shows you this data for this, this shuffled model that generates really rugged landscapes. 
And what we find is that the empirical landscapes are much closer to this additive model, right? They tend to be single peaked landscapes. They're very different from what you'd expect in this, this highly uh, rugged model. But there's also variation in the number of peaks, right? Some landscapes do have um, more than one peak. The next thing that we could look at is the number of binding sites in a peak. So when you think of a peak, you might be tempted to think of just a single sequence being in that peak, but our data don't always um, agree with that, that expectation. Um, so here again, we're looking at distributions for the additive model, the empirical data, and the shuffled model. And what we find here is that again, this distribution of the empirical data much more closely resembles that of the additive model than it does of the shuffled model. So these peaks in these empirical landscapes tend to contain uh, multiple sequences. And importantly, there's variation in the number of sequences per peak, and we're going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, we also studied the uh, mutational accessibility of uh, these peaks in each landscape, and I explained sort of what I mean by that by example. Um, so here I'm showing a genotype network of transcription factor binding sites. Um, but I, I've just chosen this one because it's small. And what we'll do is we'll zoom in on this, this peak here. So this is the peak sequence. And when we have the zoomed in view, the number in each vertex represents the mutational distance to that, that peak sequence. Um, and for each mutational distance, what we'll do is we'll look at all possible mutational paths to the global peak. So for instance, here I'm showing one mutational path that goes from a sequence that's two mutations from the global peak to the global peak. And we'll just ask what fraction of all of these paths are just increasing in binding affinity. Right, so this particular path, so here on the y-axis we have binding affinity, on the x-axis we have the distance to the peak. We see that this binding affinity is just increasing along this path, so we'd say that's an accessible mutational path. Similarly, this other path from the same starting sequence is also mutationally accessible. Right? We're just increasing binding affinity. And then, in contrast, if we start with this sequence and take this mutational path, we have to go through this valley and binding affinity. So we'd say that is not an accessible mutational path. So for any given mutational distance, we'd say mutational accessibility is simply um, the fraction of paths that are accessible. So the number of black lines divided by the total number of lines. Okay, so I can show you these data. Um, first, just let me orient you sort of to the structure of these genotype networks. So you're, first, you're just looking at a distribution of the mutational distance to the global peak. So um, the average is between three and five um, uh, mutations to, to the global peak. And now if we look at the mutational accessibility of these peaks as a function of the distance to the peak, we see, first of all, what we expect, right? The farther you are from the global peak, the less likely you are to be able to get there by a mutationally accessible paths. So we have this decrease. But I think what's, what's actually quite surprising about this trend is that even when you're as far away as possible, there's still around 20% of all possible paths that are mutationally accessible. So in this regard, these, these landscapes are highly navigable, right? They're smooth, they're mutationally accessible. And if we compare uh, these findings to what we expect from our, our, our two null models, we see that in this case, we're really intermediate between the two null models. We can't really say that it's this, in terms of mutational accessibility, these peaks are more like the additive or the, the, rugged, the rugged null model. All right. Um, so as I said before, there's, there's variation in the number of sequences in a global peak. And when we're doing these analyses, and actually all of the analyses that I've talked about today, we're always acutely aware of the fact that we are working with data that were generated by an in vitro assay, right? So we wanted to know to what extent do our findings say anything about the evolution of, of binding sites in vivo. And in each of these studies, we, we really looked into that. I just want to present one analysis um, from this study. So since we saw that there is variation in the number of sequences per peak, we hypothesized that those transcription factors that had global peak sequences that were very narrow, they would exhibit less diversity in their binding sites than would transcription factors that have global peaks that are very broad. So if you're a transcription factor that has a global peak that looks more like the Matterhorn than it does the Millet zone, we would expect you to have um, fewer sequences I'm sorry, less diversity in these peaks. Yeah, so yeah, fewer sequences. Okay, so what we did is we looked at um, 19 Saccharomyces cerevisiae strains, and we calculated diversity of binding sites in these strains for 23 yeast transcription factors, and we then related that measure of diversity with the size of the global peak. And we found this, this very striking 
correlation, and this is a correlation that, that holds up even after we control for things like the overall specificity of the transcription factor as measured by the information content of its, its position weight matrix. So this was um, one of several analyses that uh, made us feel that these landscapes that we're constructing from in vitro data actually tell us something about how binding sites evolve in vivo. And this is surprising, right, because there's just tons of other factors uh, involved in, in gene regulation in vivo that are completely abstracted away in these in vitro assays. Okay, um, so that is the research part of the talk. Um, and just to sort of zoom out, I think that the, these studies have, have sort of helped us to, to better understand how gene regulation is simultaneously robust and capable of bringing Scientific variations such as changes in pigmentation patterns and body plans that, um, that, that, that really embody a lot of the, the diversity of life around us. And now, since this is a talk for a bioinformatics audience, I, I would also just like to highlight a, a tool that we developed um, that uh, allows you to um, take whatever data that it is that you're working with that you think um, these kinds of analyses might help you better understand um, and to Use those data to perform all of the analyses that I talked about today in a really just easy to use format. So this, this web server is called it's called the GeneNet server, so it's a web server. There's also an underlying Python package that I'll talk about briefly. Um, but basically, all you need is these two columns of an input file. So you have to have some genotype, uh, and then you have to have some categorical phenotype assigned to each genotype. So in our case, here I'm showing you the genotypes are DNA sequences, and the phenotypes are the regulatory proteins that bind those sequences. Then you can also have a quantitative phenotype, which I'm calling score here. So in our case, this is um, binding affinity. And then you have some measurement of noise. Uh, these two columns are totally optional, though. So to give another example, like if you're interested in um, uh, uh, the relationship between RNA sequences and RNA structures, the genotypes could be RNA sequences. The categorical phenotype could be like which um, particular structure that sequence folds into. The score could be the folding energy, and the noise could be some measurement of your confidence in that folding energy, say, right? The point is simply to, to show you this is super simple input form, and all you need is to put your data in this form, you pipe it into this server, and it will literally perform every analysis that I described today in this talk. Not literally, with the exception of the binding site diversity one. It doesn't do anything with the view data. But, um, Right, so it's, I think, a pretty convenient tool. Uh, it also has these nice interactive visualizations that you can play around with, so you can look at your genotype networks, you can move your genotypes around, um, really get a feel for your data. And if you're not the type that likes to work with a web server, um, the software engineer uh, slash research scientist that, that worked on this, Fahad Khalid, he developed a really nice Python package um, that implements all of, all of these analyses that, that I described today. I don't expect you to be able to read this code, um, what I want, what I put this up here just to show you that there's, there's only 13 lines of executable code here, those are the ones that are not grayed out, and those 13 lines are sufficient to, to reproduce all of the analyses that I talked about today. So it's, it's really like, it's a nice little tool. All right. Um, so I did not do this work alone, right? This has been all very collaborative. Um, I, a lot of the work uh, was done with a PhD student in Andreas Wagner's group named Jose Avila Rodriguez. Um, the GeoNets tool and this RNA binding protein um, research was, was done in collaboration with Fahad Khalid. And then finally, all of this was done in collaboration with Professor Andreas Wagner. Um, these are my funding sources uh, over the, the course of this um, the period where we, we, we did this work. And finally, if you're interested in reading more, um, this, is, this is really the, the body of work that I, I just 